So the first question would be, tell us about yourself. Talk about your personal life when you're asked to talk about yourself. I am married or I have a boyfriend and we're planning to head off to Thailand for our wedding this summer. <laughs> what motivated you to apply for this role? And this is the answer. I Hello my loves, welcome back to the channel. My name is Chioma, just in case this is the very first time you are seeing this face. So welcome to episode three of the jobs series. How has it been so far? I hope you've been enjoying it. You've been taking lots of notes and you've been gaining a lot of knowledge from these videos. Okay, I aim to please. <laughs> Anyways, in today's video, I am going to be talking about interviewing. So interviewing like a pro, right? By the way, if you've just landed on here for the very first time and you're wondering where you can find the other two videos in the jobs series, please go back into my channel. There's a playlist, but as well, I am going to leave links in the description box to the previous two videos. And so it's a natural progression, isn't it? After you have submitted an application, you get ready for an interview. I always have my notebook here, so I'm going to be referring to it because <laughs> there's a lot to say on here. I have given examples of the kind of interview questions that you would probably get as someone who is at entry level and just looking for their first job in social work. I just pulled out five questions that are highly likely that you will get. Maybe you will not get all five, but you might get one or two out of the five, okay? All right, so I am going to be using an example based on a caseworker role that you've been invited to interview for. And this caseworker role is located in a domestic violence support service. I mean, I am all about domestic violence. I better stick to my area of specialization, right? And that's why I am using this as an example. Let's get into the interview. What I'm going to do is I will read the question and then also read the answer, the sample answer that I prepared. It's going to show up on the screen. So you just read along with me, all right? So the first question might probably be, tell us a little bit about yourself. And this is the answer that I prepared. Hello, thank you so very much for giving me the opportunity to interview for this position today. My name is Chioma. I have always had a strong passion for working in the DV space to support women and children escaping violence. This passion was a motivating factor for my decision to obtain a degree in social work. My past experience ranges from volunteering roles where I provided crisis and emergency support to survivors escaping violence to my most recent experience where I was successful at arranging short to long-term housing for women and their children leaving violence. I bring strong communication and advocacy skills. I love collaborative practice, which helps me build strong, meaningful professional relationships in both interpersonal and multidisciplinary, even interagency settings. I believe in the autonomy of the client and my approach is client-centered in working towards the best outcomes for them while also being mindful of professional boundaries confidentiality and the ethics of the social work profession. So with that answer, what you've been able to demonstrate are your past work experience, the client group that you've worked with and how it aligns to the role. Remember, this role is for a caseworker in a domestic violence support service. So in that answer, you've demonstrated already that your past work experience, your skills, and your qualifications align to what is required in that role, okay? So think about other things that you might want to add to talking about yourself, all right? But the last thing you want to do is to talk about your personal life when you're asked to talk about yourself, okay? So don't go on there and be like, oh, I am married or I have a boyfriend and we're planning to head off to Thailand for our wedding this summer. <laughs> as exciting as that might be, that's not what they're asking you for. <laughs> Anyways, let's go to question number two, which is what motivated you to apply for this role? And this is the answer I prepared. I was attracted to this role because 
not only does it align with my career objectives, I also see it as a great opportunity to apply my skills to a wider range of practice areas, especially complex care management and stakeholder engagement. For instance, it will afford me a chance to use my communication skills to advocate for appropriate supports when a survivor interacts with the police or the judicial system to achieve outcomes that make an actual difference in their lives. I also understand that your organization takes a strong stand on feminist practices and that is consistent with one of my own values as a person and a professional. I am interested in learning and contributing to relevant programs and initiatives that enhance community education in the areas of DV and I see that your organization has some notable programs in that regard. For instance, and this is where you want to give examples of programs that you've probably read about that the organization has created or programs that they are involved in, initiatives that they have rolled out. Okay, does that make sense? Does that make sense? <laughs> As always, add, take out, depending on what's relevant to the role you're applying for. Okay, so let's go on to question number three. Question three is, What's your understanding of this role and how you fit into the responsibilities required of this role? My answer, I understand that this role involves conducting intake assessments, which will incorporate safety and risk assessments for clients and their children. Safety assessments will prioritize children at risk of harm, as well as suicidality, mental health issues using relevant assessment tools. There will be elements of escalating concerns through mandatory reporting where risk of harm issues to a child are identified, police reports, mental health triaging, as well as providing support through other relevant processes that may include courts and support coordination. I expect to be carrying out liaison with internal and external stakeholders, providing psychoeducation, creating case plans, some counseling and referrals where appropriate. I take privacy and confidentiality seriously and understand the importance of keeping accurate records. So again, with this answer, you have demonstrated your knowledge of that area of practice and some of the day-to-day -day activities you're going to be carrying out in that practice. Another thing is using industry-specific language or terminology. So when you talk about risk assessments, when you talk about escalating, when you talk about mandatory reporting, these are things that are specific to, you know, that allied health environment. So it's always good for you to use industry-specific language. And in this answer as well, you have demonstrated your knowledge of processes. All right, so at this point, have you subscribed? Let's take a moment to make sure that you're subscribed. It's going to take less than 10 seconds. Click on subscribe, click on the bell. That's all you need to do. Thank you very much. Let's continue. So let's move on to number four. And question number four is a scenario type question. It's likely that you will get this kind of question, okay? So this is the scenario that you're asked to respond to. If you receive the referral from another agency regarding a client at risk of harm from domestic violence, how would you work with the client and her children to establish safety? First, you want to establish that the client has given consent to be contacted, very important. And when, when you contact the client, you explain confidentiality and the limits to confidentiality to the client. Basically, you want to assure the clients that they are having a confidential chat with you, but you also want to explain where the limits of that confidentiality lie. For instance, if a client discloses anything that suggests that there's a risk of harm, an imminent risk of harm, imminent is the key word here, an imminent risk of harm to themselves or the children in their care or to someone else, then there's a limit to confidentiality around that kind of situation. It means that you might have to escalate immediately to the police or other protective services around 
or even to maybe a mental health access line. Here it is called the mental health access line, but it is just sort of like an emergency response line for mental health related concerns, okay? So you need to explain that to the client from the very beginning. Going back to that answer, you also need to ask questions to establish the safety of the client and the safety of the children. Remember, wherever children are involved, their safety takes priority. Even though your primary client is the, the woman, okay? But for the fact that minors are in the care of this woman and maybe they are still within the environment where they are exposed to the abuse, their safety takes priority, all right? So you need to establish safety first. Safety is always the first thing, most important thing to establish. And in establishing safety, it might require that you ask questions that will give you a clearer picture of what's happening. So is the client still living at home with the abuser? What's the nature of the abuse? What's the frequency and the severity of the abuse? And all of this will go into the risk assessment you're conducting for this client. And then after that, you also want to find out what the client actually wants to do. So what is the outcome they are hoping to achieve by reaching out to a support service? Could it be that they are finally ready to leave that relationship or that situation? Or maybe they are looking for ways to support their safe stay at home, in which case, we might be looking at getting the police involved to remove the abuser from the home so that the, the client and her children can stay at home safely. Or is it the case that the client and her children are actually planning to escape? Any AVOs in place, so an AVO is an apprehended violence order against the abuser. And if there is, you want to find out if there's been any breach of that AVO because in that case, it can be escalated as a criminal offense. So work out a case plan which will include the client's details, their presenting issues, risk and safety issues, the supports that are involved, whether it's professional supports or personal supports, and then their support needs. And you also want to clearly outline follow-up action in your case plan. Remember, whatever you do, you have to be client-centered. Now, I wasn't reading exactly what I wrote but I just wanted to give you some background as to what will go into forming your answer to that question because it's a scenario type question. So question number five, do you work better in a team or independently? This is a trick question because it is not an either or answer. You can't say that you work better independently and you can't say that you work better in a team. It's a trick question. So how do you answer that? This is what I would say. It is highly situation dependent. I work well independently when I require focused time to plan and prioritize my workflow, but I enjoy working in a team as it is best for collaborative practice and fostering a collegial or supportive atmosphere with my colleagues. It is great to have the input from different professional perspectives on group projects or even in case discussions. So generally, I don't mind working independently, but I also value the importance of teamwork. And that is how I would answer. Obviously, there are lots of other questions that you might be asked, but a lot of them would have elements that I have already mentioned in some of the answers I gave to the questions. And then another trick question you might get asked would be something related to your weaknesses but they are not going to come out right and say, what are your weaknesses? They are not going to say that. They might say something like, if we spoke to your current manager, what do you think they would say in relation to the area or areas that you found challenging at work? So basically they're just asking you to talk about the areas that you might struggle a little bit in. And beyond that, you want to talk about what you're going to do about those gaps you might have in your skills, in your experience that might make you to struggle, okay? So it doesn't end at just saying what the problem is, but you want to focus on how you're actually going to address that problem. When they are done asking you questions, please do not think the interview is over. When they ask if you've got any questions for them, 
say yes and ask questions. So some of the questions you might want to ask would be, how do they support employee well-being to manage vicarious trauma or compassion fatigue or burnout? That's the more general understandable term, right? So how do they support employee well-being to manage burnout? Another question that you might ask, and I actually like this question because you know, it's just as tough as the questions they've been asking you during the interview. So you might ask them, what's their biggest challenge with their target client group in terms of budgetary limitations that create gaps in their service provision? Ask them, I'm not going to give you any answers around this. It is up to them to answer that question, all right? And then ask any other questions that might come to mind. The only rule of thumb that I would mention here would be not to ask any general knowledge questions. Anything that you know is public knowledge about that company, don't ask that question. Actually, it puts you in a very bad light. It means you didn't do your research. Don't ask those sorts of questions. You can ask questions like, okay, what does a day-to-day -day look like in this role? What sorts of things can you expect to be doing on a daily basis? What are the key presentations of their client groups or the most common presenting issues with the client group that the company works with? So you can ask that kind of question. I'm sorry, my voice is giving out again, so I'm just going to have a drink of water. But actually, we've come to the end of this video and the end of episode three. So there's only one more episode left in this series and I am not going to give any information about the fourth one because it's a surprise. It's a surprise. <laughs> you want to stick around for that. But I hope this has been helpful. I hope that with all the three videos that I have made so far with, within this series that there's been a lot of information and a lot of knowledge you've gained from these videos. Please, again, remember to give this video a thumbs up Thank you for sharing with your friends and thank you for subscribing. I'll see you again in my next video. Bye-bye.